focus of tonight's discussion is a new translation of the diaries of Franz Kafka. Ross Benjamin's translation of the Kafka Diaries was published just a few months ago and has received an extraordinary amount of positive notice. Uh, in a feature-length New Yorker piece, some of you may have read, on the Diaries by Becca Rothfeld, she describes the publication as momentous and presents a very different picture of this essential writer than we're used to seeing. Here is Kafka in full whether following the latest health fad or attending the theater, sharing his innermost thoughts, as well as providing commentary on his daily life. Ross Benjamin is an award-winning translator of several books, including Michael Marr's Speak Nabokov and Josef Ross Job. He received a Guggenheim Fellowship for his work on the diaries, which he spent about eight years completing. Joining him is the gifted memoirist, essayist, and novelist, Andre Asman. He is the author of the novels Call Me By Your Name, now a major motion picture, and Eight White Nights, the essay collection False Papers, Essays on Exile and Memory, and the memoir Out of Egypt. Andre is also a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the New York Republic, Granta, and Paris Review, and is the director of the Writers Institute at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So this is really a very distinguished start for our new program, and we're thrilled to have both of these gentlemen tonight with us. So please join me in welcoming Ross Benjamin and Andre Alton. Franz Kafka, 1883-1924. He dies at the age of 41. No trace really of his life or that much. It's just paperly trace. I see some people. Yes, OK. All right, I'll do this. Is this working? Yes, it is. Is this better, actually? OK, fine, OK. Uh, and now we are holding this massive volume, which required years of annotation and research to say nothing of translation eight years. Uh, it's a great pleasure to sit in this glorious building, in this fabulous room with this behind me, and to be with Ross Benjamin. So let's go directly to the diaries themselves. Can you give us some background on the diaries themselves? Sure. Yeah, I'm going to try to just bell out so that we don't have to pass the microphone back and forth. Um, so um, Kafka kept these diaries between 1909 and 1923. So that's from about the age of 26 until the year before he died. Uh, just about a year before he died, he wrote the very last diary entry. And then he died uh, in 1924. So next year will be the centennial of his death. Um, and they were in, they were, uh, by the time he had finished them, they were 12 notebooks. And there were a couple of bundles of loose papers, most of which he had given to his um, love interest at the time when he gave them to her, Melena Yasenska, or at the time she was Melena Polak, a married woman with whom he was carrying on an epistolary romance mainly. They met for about four days in Vienna. And he handed over to her his diaries. Uh, there's a very late entry in this. So this compiles all 12 of those notebooks and those bundles of loose papers. The very late entry where he says, I just gave all the diaries to Melena. And that's somewhere you know, over here. And that means he gave all of the previous notebooks and ripped out the pages of that very notebook and gave them to her. They were in her hands when he died. When he died, he uh, left written instructions for his friend Max Brod, uh, who he appointed his literary executor, asking him to burn all of his diaries and his unpublished writings and manuscripts all the letters to collect them from their recipients and, and destroy them, um, which Broad, whenever Kafka had asked him to do this in person, had always refused to do. And uh, just to give you a smidgen of the background of their relationship, Broad really was the friend who prodded Kafka to publish his work even during his lifetime, who connected him with publishers, with the literary world, and kept pushing him to get the stuff out there that he wanted to kind of jealously guard and continue to perfect 
perhaps infinitely rewrite and rework. Uh, uh, it was never quite up to the standards. And Kafka um, maybe tellingly left instructions for the person uh, who was probably, to his knowledge, least likely to burn his work, uh, instructing him to do so. <laughs> At the same time, Kafka was an attorney. He left a letter which would have been legally binding. And so I, I always think of it as maybe um, the last act of this genius of ambivalence who managed to give us a work that is about ambivalence, that embodies ambivalence, and that, uh, and that even left this incredibly ambivalent instruction, um, which doesn't mean he didn't want them burned, but, but Broad uh, uh, never doubted that he would be incapable of burning a piece of Kafka's writing. Uh, he said about just, it might have been weeks, definitely within months of Kafka's death, he set about on the project of publishing the unfinished manuscripts of the three novels that Kafka had left behind in somewhat fragmentary and disordered mm -hmm. fashion. Uh, the, he had left them behind in that fashion, Broad published them in a different fashion. But he, um, in the decades that followed, uh, published other posthumous writings like fragments and aphorisms yeah. and went on to publish uh, Kafka's letters and in the 40s finally his diaries and so the afterlife of the diaries has been long and fraught we'll probably get more into it um, uh, the last bit I'll mention about just what the diaries really are is because uh, when we think of diaries we may think of kind of daily entries um, uh, recording and reflecting on your daily life which is indeed something Kafka did in these notebooks, but he also did every other imaginable thing in these notebooks, including writing fiction, um, uh, attempting to write uh, prose pieces that maybe uh, uh, cross back and forth over the line between autobiography and fiction, but that he might sort of rework in numerous successive drafts. He would draft letters in the diaries, um, draft essays, reviews, um, so, in a very unsystematic and even disorderly fashion, he crammed um, all sorts of um, types of writing, aphorisms, into his diaries. So they really um, uh, come to us as a reflection of his process, of his creative process, of his literary workshop. Well, um, you, I mean, you said something about the, the fact that it's messy. Mm -hmm. It is extremely messy, and you wonder what does this collection do for him as a man, as a person living. In other words, he spends, he, he has a job, mm -hmm. okay, and it takes up not an insignificant amount of his time. He's had a few relations, he has a lot of friends, or well, I think he has a lot of friends because he's always making them laugh. Yeah, he has okay. an intimate circle of friends, yeah. yeah. And, but then he spends a great deal of time writing in this diary. Yeah. What is it doing for him? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't want to get reductive about it and say it's only doing one thing for him. Right. But um, he, he usually wrote at night. So he worked by day as an um, attorney for an insurance uh, company that was partially state run. And uh, he drafted you know, accident reports. It was a, a Workers' Accident Insurance Institute. That's in fact what it was called, the Workers' Accident Insurance Institute for the Kingdom of Bohemia. And uh, he had gone to law school and he worked drafting. His, his official position was called Concipist. And there was actually a, a lot of writing, a lot of paperwork, but also writing long reports um, and uh, submitting petitions on behalf of workers. That was his day job. And then at night, he would write a very different sort of thing, uh, sometimes in his diary, sometimes in other places, in loose papers or in other notebooks that he kept that weren't necessarily diary notebooks. And um, it seems whenever he was writing, this is my impression from the diaries and what strikes me as unique about these diaries, maybe unique or at least um, uh, very appealing about them, is that whenever he was writing, it seemed like it was an occasion for him to create literature, for something to happen at least. And do things, major literary breakthroughs do happen in the midst of the diaries. He writes the entirety of the short story, The Judgment, in a single elated night, overnight sitting, in the middle of these diaries and they it just kind of bursts into being after you know notebooks and notebooks filled with kind of um, abortive attempts to write other types of literary pieces and so I, I do think whenever he set pen to paper there was the potential for him to create something uh, literary something poetic and and so even when he wrote about having a headache he would 
very quickly start constructing images that no one in history had ever used to describe a headache in daily life. You know, this, it feels like an inner leprosy and reminds me of the skull cross sections in, in textbooks and <laughs> such that it's almost like a painless dissection while alive and I can feel the dissecting knife, you know, m t turning back and forth and dividing um, very fine membranes, even finer, very close to working brain parts. Yeah. You know, and so there's a point where he crosses a threshold, or maybe he's always writing at a threshold between life and art, and that seemed to be, um, in a way, I think that was what he wanted from writing, and even from writing in his diaries. Um, and there's the question of what he was doing by keeping diaries, uh, and he kept other notebooks where he did writing that he didn't call his diaries, called these his diaries, and they do contain more self-observation self more autobiographical reflection than those other notebooks do. And yet he didn't date every entry. Sometimes you think he's writing something autobiographical because there's even in a footnote that sa he says, you know, he has these series of rough drafts at the very beginning of the diaries, which are that each one begins, uh, when I think about it, I must confess that my education has done me great harm. And then he begins to list the people who educated him, my parents, my teachers. Uh, but then it becomes more and more fanciful, like even some ladies in summer parks, and you wouldn't think it to look at them, and uh, a helmsman and a swimming master. And I, he reproaches them all for his bad upbringing. And there's footnotes in the beginning, like, oh, a cook who, who took me to school for a year. And then there's a footnote saying, well, he wrote about this cook in one of his letters. There was a cook who brought him to school for a year and who did scold him on the way to school and, I don't know, tell him to stand straighter or whatever. <laughs> and he complained about it in a letter. So you're like, oh, this is, he's writing about himself. But then at some point, as he's reworking this, he keeps beginning again at the beginning and creating longer and longer lists of, of people who may or may not be factual, who he blames for his bad education. At some point he says, I am 40 and short and fat. And at the time he was writing this, he was 26. <laughs> he didn't have an ounce of fat on his body, Kafka. Um, he uh, was unusually tall, especially for that era. Um, and so at that point, you realize he's turned into a fictional narrator. Uh, when that happened, you can't pinpoint. And that's the case throughout the diaries. When did he start dramatizing, poetizing? Right. Anyway, th th that's wonderful. I mean, that we are learning things about Kafka. Um, I think... Um, I mean, you get the sense that he was a miserable man. He was not, I mean, he could make you laugh a lot, mm -hmm. but he was ultimately quite unhappy. Mm -hmm. And on, on one hand, and then he puts some of that unhappiness in his papers, in his diaries, or whatever it is that he's writing. And I've always thought there's a third guy, and you've got a good grasp of, of who he is after translating this for eight years. Um, what is this other person that we that is not on paper, and that is not the one in the novels. Is there someone else who's basically trying to speak forth? I don't know. I, I'm just asking this. Because yeah. we all lie, OK? Right. Yeah, and, and I'm sure he lied as well. But in, in a sense, when, even when he's lying, what is behind the lie? What is behind the joke? What is behind the yeah. absurdity? Well, I mean. For me, it was really important actually not to, ah, okay. find, not to look for that guy. Yeah. Um, like I, uh, maybe somewhat perversely in translating someone's diaries, I made a point of stopping short of trying to retrieve something like the real Kafka. Yes. Okay. Um, it was very important to me not to, because part of the project of translating these diaries, I, I think, was that for some of us, maybe we we thought we knew who, we think we know who Kafka is already before we even maybe read his work because we've right. heard about him or we've seen the influence he's had on mo modern literature or on, you know, imagery or, or the idea of the Kafkaesque or something or we associate him with these really nightmarish scenarios of some of his most famous stories and novels. A man who wakes up as, a, as an insect, uh, a, a man who's accused of, of a crime without being told what crime he committed. Um, and ultimately executed, and we have this, so there's this Kafka myth, this myth that could even be very forbidding if you haven't actually opened up the work to read it and discovered Kafka's not really a forbidding writer. He's an, a writer who is very captivating and immediately, um, he's oddly immediately accessible in one way, even though you can never make heads or tails of him afterward, but, but the story 
draws you in with its vivid right. drama and storytelling and the physical experience of reading it. Anyhow, I've gotten on a digression, but this... Um, it's, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> but this idea of, of, of knowing who Kafka was, I found the danger of it was that it would narrow my ability to translate the extreme heterogeneity of who he is on the page. Right. So he's really is um, sh both shaping his very distinct ses sensibility in the diaries and testing out all different ways of depicting his inner struggles and preoccupations. So some of the things that clearly we know about Kafka um, that he circles again and again in his work are this set of preoccupations with his right. body being somehow frail and defective or diseased even long before he was diagnosed with tuberculosis or had contracted an actual disease with his um, inner conflict over whether to marry and uh, uh, both the supposed longing and the dread of domestic life, uh, never having enough time to write, feeling drained by a stultifying office job. These kind of biographical details that are almost um, cliches about Kafka now that are certainly um, things that he comes back to again and again through the diaries. And yet, what's fascinating to me about the, what's on the page is that he doesn't sound like a broken record because he's always reimagining right. these right. Um, preoccupations with new um, creative impulses, like now I'll write it as an animal story. Now it's a charming letter of excuse to my boss for why I can't come into work today because I'm so, um, I'm being driven mad by my artistic impulses and so on. Like it's a, now it's kind of a shtick, you know? Um, and, then, and then again, it's, 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 it's a very profound, you know, self-meditation um, or self-reflection. And so this um, way in which he made these, he made his suffering really generative in his work in a way that also feels, it's why people, I think, get peculiarly energized and enlivened by reading a writer, or I do. And I think I've seen, you know, from other, you know, I've read other people testify to this, feeling um, a kind of that there's something invigorating about reading a guy who's just endlessly fetching. Yeah. But because he's, <laughs> what's invigorating is the um, way in which he, he makes it an imaginative resource that he exploits you know, he makes it such a rich imaginative resource. Can you imagine him? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to ask you to read something. But before I do, can you imagine him sort of visiting Freud or any kind of shrink? What would they tell him? You, right. you messed up, man. Or yeah. what would they say? Well, there's what the shrink would say. And there's, I, I can't imagine Kafka. Well, there is biographical information that tells us that Kafka was not interested in being psychoanalyzed. Right. Right. He was interested in maybe the discourse of psychoanalysis, or we can surmise that he was based on aspects of his work, that he seemed to play with some of the tropes of psychoanalysis. Or, uh, he was certainly aware of them. There's a very famous moment in the diaries after he writes the judgment where he kind of lists a bunch of, uh, not necessarily influences, but, but things that were in the mix while he was writing the story that he feels so profoundly um, ecstatic about having written uh, in this overnight sitting. And he, he, he names, you know, a, a short story by Franz Verfall, something else. And he says, thoughts of Freud, of course, naturally thoughts of Freud, almost as if it's the most obvious. And this is a story about a conflict between father and son that escalates to the point of the father sentencing the son to death and the son carrying out the execution. <laughs> so, of course, there are thoughts of Freud in this extremely Oedipal story. And, um, but, um, and now I've digressed, but the, uh, uh, his interest in psychoanalysis, like his interest in his own suffering, I feel like only seemed salient in the process of writing, as opposed right. to being something that he was interested in um, doing. Outside it, of the yeah, room. Yeah, in the, in the, in the right. um, consulting room. Right. And he, he didn't have many mentions of psychoanalysis in his letters, but there, there are places where he cast doubt where he sort of said, like, I buy a lot of this theory, but I don't think it can have any curative. Uh, no, he is beyond cure, let's put it this yeah, way. Yeah, or not interested in the cure, I think. He was interested in, maybe he didn't believe, it. maybe he thought of himself as incurable, and that was like his starting point. Right. Yeah, and from there, well, what do you do? Yeah. You want to read something? Sure. Um, 
well, I could just read anything at this point. Um, I'll, I'll read, um, <coughs> I just opened up to this. Uh, on January 23rd, 1922, um, restlessness, he's writing, he, restlessness came back and then he, several reasons that he feels restless. And then he says, restlessness from the fact that my life until now has been a marching in place a development at most in the sense a tooth becoming hollow and decaying undergoes one. The way I led my life, this is by the way, he, he has tuberculosis. He's two years away from dying. So this is a kind of retrospective reflection of a life that is uh, imminently being cut short. The way I led my life never proved its worth in the slightest. It was as, as if I, like every other person, had been given the center of a circle as if I then, like every other person, had to follow the decisive radius and then draw the beautiful circle. Instead, I have perpetually started the radius, but again and again had to break it off immediately. Examples, piano, violin, languages, German studies, anti-Zionism, Zionism, Hebrew, gardening, carpentry, literature, marriage attempts, an apartment of my own. He lived with his parents. Uh, that's, that's the answer. He already. still lived with his parents, yeah. Uh, the last year of his life, he, he moved out of his parents' apartment. The center of the imaginary circle bristles with beginnings of radii. There's no more space for a new attempt. No space means age, weakness of nerves, and no further attempt means the end. If I have ever brought the radius a little bit farther than usual, perhaps in the case of my law studies or engagements, Everything was simply worse by this little bit instead of better. Wow, yeah. that's lovely. That's really lovely. <laughs> Perfect. Um, let's move on to the, the, the one that is the thorny issue, which is Max Brod. Um, because he edited one version of the diaries and I, I, as, as you prove, is he left a lot of things out or mismanaged them, mistranslated them or doctored them. Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, so when Broad did decide to publish these diaries for public, uh, to prepare these diaries for publication, <coughs> it was, it, it's interesting to think about psychologically, like he was about to expose his friend in a way his friend never wanted to be exposed, but he'd been doing it for decades already. It was now 1940, you know, mid-40s after the war, immediately after the war. Uh, he'd been publishing the unfinished novels and so on with Shokin books. Um, which was at the time in Palestine and in New York. And right after the war, actually, Hannah Arendt took over the editorial directorship of Shokin Books. And one of the first things she did was um, oversee the translation of Broad's manuscript of Kafka's diaries. What Broad did is he got the diaries from his vault and he prepared a manuscript that, well, first he transcribed it. And an, interest, an interesting little detail of the story is that Hannah Arendt had a copy of that typescript that I don't think she was supposed to have in the New York office of Shokin Books that was complete and faithful to what Kafka had actually written in each oh. notebook. Uh, that's the first thing Broad did. But what Broad really wanted Hannah Arendt to have and the people in, in the New York office to have and what became the basis for every translation of Kafka's diaries throughout the world was Broad's edition, which to craft that edition he did, uh, uh, he made uh, several types of really heavy ha handed interventions. So one thing he did that's very simple and that might seem obvious is he put it all in chronological order. But to do that, you actually have to already make a number of um, significant decisions because Kafka didn't date everything and he used multiple notebooks at the same time. So if he started several notebooks over the years but they still blank pages in them, years later he might grab an earlier notebook and, and continue in that notebook or even continue from the back. So it was in disarray, Broad imposed a certain order on it. Kafka's writing in the diaries was very unpolished and fragmented, misspellings, regionalisms. He wrote in a more spoken rhythm, like he used contractions that you wouldn't usually use in written German, but you might use them if you're speaking. Um, and he often used them in his drafts. And then when he prepared his rough drafts for publication, he would tidy them up and formalize the language. And Broad formalized the language tidied up the language, ironed it out so that the imperfections really didn't come through. Maybe most significantly, 
the diaries are full of these literary attempts where Kafka takes sometimes dozens of stabs at what is recognizably the same material but being transformed in radically different ways and then often breaking off and starting again and repeating huge chunks of text while veering off in new directions um, and in complete disorganization. And instead of presenting those in that fashion, Broad stitched together the scraps of text that could conceivably be pieced together like a puzzle into a composite into one kind of um, uh, uh, integrated whole mm -hmm. that it, Kafka had never managed to produce. Instead, Kafka produced this disintegration of many attempts. Uh, but in those attempts, what you find, I think, in the German edition on which my translation is based, which is simply a transcription of the diaries, notebook by notebook, complete and uncensored, and also um, uh, to the extent possible uh, uncorrected so that Kafka drops a lot of punctuation. He sometimes muddles his syntax and his sentences. Those were left um, in their untidiness in the German edition. And in my translation, I attempted to reproduce that untidiness as far as possible, including errors, what seemed like syntactical errors but are really actually part of the process of writing when you haven't finished yet. Um, uh, where you might actually mid-sentence start going in a different direction with the sentence in a way where you've never gone back and given the sentence a um, uh, correct construction, but what you've left is a record of, of the creation and, and often Kafka would then start the whole text over and then you would see the more uh -huh. refined version of it in the next repetition, which was all missing from Broad's edition. Finally, he cut out the actual texts of rough drafts of works that Kafka did publish in his lifetime, but which had their genesis in the diaries in a rougher form, like The Judgment, which is a, you know, is if, if the diaries have an arc at all, it's kind of, or dramatic arc, it's Kafka struggling to realize his literary aspirations, his, 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 uh, his picture of a kind of idealized, um, externalization of what he calls his dreamlike inner life for the tremendous world in his head. And then in this one night where he writes the judgment, actually feeling like he's fulfilled that, feeling so gratified and ecstatic. And that happens in the diaries. And yet Brode just replaced it with an end note saying, here Kafka wrote the judgment, um, as opposed to being able to actually see on the page. And, and what comes across when you don't correct, um, when you don't polish up the judgment in the diaries, but you leave it in the, in the form in which Kafka wrote it in, in, in the act of composition is the words didn't really change very much when he polished it for publication. But what, ha but what happened while he was writing it is as he was seized by inspiration, he started to drop commas and quotation marks and paragraph breaks. And you can actually see that happen almost physically on the page. And then in an entry the day after he wrote the judgment where he's describing his, his creative ecstasy, he, he says how there was a point where he didn't look up from the paper again. And I feel like I can trace that point in the punctuation that he left behind, uh, where the punctuation starts to be omitted more frequently as he writes more hastily um, in the grip of this. When we spoke uh, a few days ago, we mentioned that word which sort of haunts me. He is slippery. Mm -hmm. And there's something about his grammar that is slippery, but he himself is slippery. Do you want to talk about that a bit more? I, yeah. Did you all hear me? Or? He's slippery okay. and, and elusive. Um, and his sense is elusive. Sometimes it maybe eludes him. Like, and he writes these really complex sentences that sometimes seem to kind of twist and warp around a possible sense, but then often reverse themselves mid-sentence. Uh, there's this great one where he's talking about his happiness. And he's saying, uh, I can't even describe the creature of unhappiness that I am and this effervescence that fills me, you know, a happiness of which I can convince, my, oh, I forget how it is, I should probably find it. Um, it's, it. The reversal happens in the middle of this sentence where he says, of which I can convince myself at any moment of its non-existence even now. So the happiness is suddenly uh, annihilated just in the of which of that sentence. Um, but yeah, his elusiveness was something I wanted to capture rather than, rather than trying to capture what was eluding me or him in the writing, I was trying to capture the elusiveness, which is somewhat perverse for a translator because a lot what you're trying to do is decode a foreign language. Um, and in Kafka, I often had to, you know, I would spend 
I spent years trying to decode what he was really talking about a lot. And sometimes even when I felt convinced of my interpretation of what he was really talking about, I realized it was the elusiveness that mattered. And I ought not really translate in a, in a, in a way that all too um, heavy-handedly um, reflected this interpretation that I'd come up with that I thought was so clever mm -hmm. because I wanted the, it to be as baffling in my translation as it was to me when I read it in the original. Um, and so I ended up with this, I think of it as a somewhat perverse motto for a translator, which is, you know, um, if something baffled me in the original and by the time I translated it, it and I read my translation, it didn't baffle me as much, then I had failed to do it justice. God, okay, that, that, that's a tough one. <laughs> so you have to remain basically elusive in order to be faithful yeah. to him. So I could get concrete about it, like there are places where he's very vague, where I thought I figured out what he was talking about, and yet he was writing in a kind of mental shorthand where he um, isn't really expressing in the syntax or the words what I think he's talking about. And by the time I thought I'd really nailed it down, I realized I still have to translate the vagueness. Oh. Um, or that was my actual intention was to translate the vagueness. So I have this one about the, there's a point where the flags just become. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> yes. I but know. I found it. So I'll read another little passage, which Fine. will also give you another taste of his diary writing. It's from December 1914. And I'll read you the passage and then I'll explain what the, where the slipperiness comes in. And in fact, I'll be able to refer back to the old translation too. Beginning of every novella, ridiculous at first. So he's writing about his own creation pro process, creative process. The beginning of every novella, ridiculous at first. It seems hopeless that this new, still unfinished, everywhere sensitive organism will be able to sustain itself in the finished organization of the world, which like every finished organization, strives to close itself off. To be sure, one forgets here that the novella, if it is justified, bears its finished organization in itself, even if it has not yet completely unfolded itself. Therefore, the despair in this regard in the face of the beginning of a novella is unjustified. Parents would have just as much cause to despair in the face of their infant, for they had not wanted to bring this wretched and especially ridiculous being into the world. To be sure, one never knows whether the despair one feels is the justified or the unjustified one. But this consideration can provide a certain support. The lack of this experience has already done me harm. Okay. So his last sentence, he says, this consideration can provide a certain support. The lack of this experience has already done me harm. And he's just been analogizing <laughs> how the ridiculous, how the beginning of a novella that doesn't have where you can't really see what it's gonna look like as a finished organism seems ridiculous, but it would be unjustified to abandon it because it, a parent with their infant would think, well, I wanted to create a human being, not this crying, you know, um, incontinent, you know, creature. <laughs> and then <coughs> he says, one never knows whether to despair. So actually I looked at the old translation to see what they made of this last sentence about this experience has already done me harm. And they just changed the word. So the word in, in the original is afarong, experience. It's a very vague, generic word for experience. And he says this experience, but syntactically it's not really related to something previously. He knows what he's talking about, probably, maybe. Yeah. He has an association. He's partially free associating in the diary. Um, the old translation decided he must have meant knowledge because oh. syntactically it's the closest thing in the, in the sentence before he says, one never knows whether the despair is justified or unjustified. So they thought syntactically, that's the closest thing he could be referring to. So they just changed the word experience to knowledge. I realized their interpretation was wrong and mine was right. And mine was, he means the experience of having had children and that the consideration provides a certain support that parents with their infants uh, would be just as unjustified in thinking they didn't mean to bring something so unfinished into the world as the writer with their unfinished work. And then he says, the lack of this experience has already done me harm. He means the experience of having children, which he comes back to again and again in the diaries as something that, for the lack of which he thinks he's missing something that would be important to be a full human being. He even quotes, I think, the Talmud, where it says, a man without a wife is no human. Um, and uh, 
Uh, that was a digression too. But the wife <laughs> would mean a <laughs> wife and family. Uh, but so now I thought I knew what he meant. But I realized after all that interpretive labor and becoming very persuasive of my own interpretation, I would be violating my own agenda with this translation if I held the reader's hand at all to guide them toward that interpretation, which of course, as Kafka says in the trial, you know, every uh, an interpretation is, and, it's, and a misinterpretation of the same thing are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Every apprehension I had of what he meant could in fact be a misapprehension, but whatever it would be, it would be a narrowing of the interpretive range mm -hmm. of the original writing. And my, my, what I really wanted was to produce something to the extent possible as open to the broadest possible range of interpretations, you know, as approximately the German original struck me as being. And it, that often meant resisting the temptation to impose a kind of narrowing or reductive. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I, my last question, I, I have another question after the last question, but I don't know that I want to ask it. I, mean, so, I think somebody, I forget who says, this, there's a, a sense that uh, Kafka's diaries are uncensored outtakes. Mm -hmm. and I said that. Yeah. You said that? In okay. the, in the okay. preface, yeah. All right. So I, I said outtakes, yeah. Okay. Uh, and did you say uncensored outtakes? Or I probably I used the that? word uncensored somewhere, okay. but the outtakes, I was actually compared it directly to like studio outtakes okay. from, yeah. Well, that may, takes me to the question I didn't mm -hmm. want to ask, but I have to ask it, is um, because I'm prurient by nature, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you all know, and, and so I, I was wondering, you know, talk to us about his sexuality. Yeah, well, uh, what comes across in this version of the diaries as opposed to the old edition, and I guess uh, very silly for somebody who wants to sell books, I left that out of the things Broad censored, uh, the lascivious stuff. So Broad, that's another major category of things he censored from the old edition were um, uh, moments of Kafka's sexuality that were either all too lewd or homoerotic. So, Every instance of same-sex desire expressed in the diaries Broad deleted in such a way as to convince future scholars who finally discovered these entries that there was some big secret about Kafka, which is not necessarily the case. Kafka was not at all secretive about these moments of, of erotic desire in his diaries. Broad decided they were not fit for public consumption, deleted them, thereby for posterity drawing more attention, attention to them, to them. Okay. such that people have written you know, whole uh, monographs on the gay Kafka just on the basis of these four or five single lines that Broad excised from the diaries, which are to be sure very erotic and um, also poetic, like uh, he was at a nudist sanatorium because uh, uh, he was a health faddist, as we know, he, he, he was interested in natural health and the nudist movement and, um, uh, and even in the homoerotic uh, um, there was a whole homoerotic discourse actually around this movement, around the homosocial, um, you know, male bonding in the woods um, while you're naked. Um, uh, he wore his swimming trunks. He said at the New Sanatorium, I'm known as the man with the swimming trunks. And there's speculation maybe also, uh, most of, he is mostly among um, uh, Gentiles, uh, among Christians, you know, non-Jewish people at the uh, sanatorium. The first word that occurred to me was worse. Um, uh, and so that maybe he was hiding his circumcision, but also maybe he was, in any case, this is a digression. He, he registers in the diaries that he saw what Broad uh, um, rendered in his edition as uh, two handsome young Swedish boys, but the line in its entirety actually read, you know, two handsome, two beautiful young Swedish boys with long legs which are so formed and taut that you could really only run your tongue along them. And then there's, uh, there's a bunch of members, as he calls them, that he observes of men, you know, the bulge of a, of a fellow, he calls it, a, you know, a sort of bulge in the uh, a fellow train passenger who he's, who's like vitality, masculine virility as he eats, he's admiring. Um, and then uh, there's, a, um, uh, there's a whole entry where he and Broad visit this collector, Pachinger, who has a whole, one of his collections is of pornography and he's showing all these photos to Kafka, and um, Kafka's kind of taking a very lewd, the way he describes the photos suggests a lascivious, and these are of, of women, but then he also is, uh, in writing about the man's sexual ex escapades that he's you know, boasting about to Broad, I guess it's locker room talk. <laughs> um, uh, 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 he, he, he imagines himself, it's, he seems to imagine himself in the position of, of a woman, he says, 
how he would uh, stuff his large member into women uh, until they were exhausted. And then he says, this submissiveness I can imagine, you know. Um, uh, so those, you know, Bro would cut them. And, and to me, it's, it's more, well, it's unsurprising that Kafka's sexuality was um, uh, all over the place because Kafka was all over the place. I mean, there's all the stuff about knives too, like of being carved up. Like he writes these very, um, these passages in his letters to Felice about wanting to be a piece of wood that the female cook, you know, uh, braces against her knee while she slices off shavings, which would be in the area of his hip, you know, to, to feed the fire. Um, so yeah, the masochism, that wasn't, that wasn't cut by Broad. But um, the, the um, Kafka's, sort of experimentalism was not just literary, he was experimental with his lifestyle. He was a vegetarian, a nudist. He did these callous, this certain set of calisthenics in front of an open window every morning. He fletcherized his food, chewing it a certain number of times before he swallowed it. Um, and he also uh, sort of burped a lot, didn't he? Or no, did the other end, the other end of the- There's a lot of flatulence, uh, broke up the flatulence, flatulence in the yes. diaries. That was a, that really showed his sort of purest, saintly image of Kafka that, that was really lay behind most of Broad's editorial interventions was an effort to present Kafka as a kind of saintly martyr to literature, pure at a loftier height than the people he was observing around him. So when he was observing, ironically, in pieties or, or sex workers, for example, uh, Broad would leave in observations of sex workers until they started to become all too carnal where Kafka describes the, actually the the hair leading from the navel of one of the sex workers to her private parts. <laughs> so he left in the description of, I don't know, stuffing money in a stocking or these kind of modernist expressionistic snapshots of urban life uh, that could be perceived as maybe more literary sketches and uh, were compatible with this image of Kafka as, a, as an ascetic literary yes. monk. Do you think we can get rid of this Kafka, this ascetic Kafka? I think we can get rid of the ascetic Kafka. I doubt we can oh, the move. the saintly one. Uh, yeah, well, somebody said to me, I, uh, that the, she said, uh, nobody can move the, the needle on sanctification oh, okay. of Kafka. Uh, so, and that might be true, but, but I think what that means is it's impossible really to diminish people's reverence for Kafka, which I'm fine with. Because yes. I revere Kafka. I love Kafka. I want more of him. You know, I want all of the many sides of him rather than this um, chiseled saintly image that to me is, is less Kafka. I see him as being diminished by the sainthood and being fuller, more complex, richer, and more interesting due to uh, everything that was originally left out. Um, and so if that inspires reverence, I, I, especially the form that he gave it in his, with his literary genius, yeah. that's why we go to him to be jolted by that genius and to be moved by it. And so uh, if that leads us to elevate him as say, you know, the giant of modernism or a great liter or, or we talk about his genius, like I would never shy from talking of his genius. Um, Broad actually explicitly said he did not think, in, the, in his biography of Kafka, he said the category to understand, the correct category for understanding Kafka is not literature, but sainthood. Oh, and it's oh. that kind of sanctification. And he said, I think he was even on his way to becoming a saint yeah. if he was not one already. And so it's that version of uh, that Kafka maybe had the key to right living. Um, or, or dispense the kind of wisdom of uh, sage-like wisdom in his, in his riddle-like aphorisms. I, I, if we're looking at his literary output and saying, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, and that makes us want to elevate him in the category of literature, I'm okay with that. You're yeah. okay with that. Yeah. Okay. I don't think he should be diminished or kicked off his pedestal. I you, think he should be opened up. I think we should be able to, I don't like the idea of a forbidding edifice of Kafkaology, as, as uh, Kundera called it, of the, this whole, of the Kafka myth. Um, uh, what I really think people should do is to engage with the works and the, um, including the diaries and the letters, which include some of his richest writing. And that in the writing, once we open it up, it's no longer this open and shut, Mm. case. Now we can, uh, uh, people have always done new and generative things with Kafka. He's been the inspiration for 
you know, several movements that have names, you know, who have gone back to Kafka and, and said, you know, he's the original existentialist or he's the yeah. original, yes. uh, um, I don't know what else. Uh, <laughs> he's been recruited, you know, and then always slips away from these categories because of course there's always more to him. Um, but that kind of um, impulse to uh, do something new with Kafka, I think should be kept alive. Um, I think it is, don't you think? It, it, yeah, I guess it's yeah. never been dead, but yeah. I guess the, the, the problem of fixing him I think by um, translating something like the diaries, that gives you so many more possible entrances into right. Kafka or ways of looking at Kafka, that that could be maybe more generative or more um, uh, can continue or could keep going, could keep this going, the constant reinvention of Kafka, which yes, probably will keep going no matter what I do, but this is my contribution to it. Uh, in fact, sorry, this is the last digression, but. He's a TikTok phenomenon now. Oh, see. Yeah, oh. he's a, a heartthrob on TikTok. So I was having this like slight um, uh, uh, feud with a critic who, not a feud, but a, a correspondence, very friendly, like two nice Jewish boys who had different, <laughs> different images of Kafka, uh, uh, you know, and, and were emailing back and forth about it. Um, you know, he, was, he, wasn't, he didn't really like this version of the diaries. He liked the old version better, and we were going back and forth. Um, and while we were arguing about, you know, whose Kafka is the Kafka that we value, there were like teenager, teenager influencers on TikTok with millions of followers who already had a completely different idea of Kafka based on reading his love letters to Melina, oh. which was that he would be a really good boyfriend. So when you talk about a misapprehension, this is like, he was historically, literally historically, a really bad boyfriend. It's like, it's on the record that Kafka was not, but they, because they're reading these love letters that he wrote to Melina, and the letters of the recipient aren't even there, so you can really imagine yourself. They're, they're posting like a picture of themselves, wide-eyed, looking over their volume of Kafka's letters of Melina with a little inscription like, or whatever it is, you know, a little bit of text that says, um, oh, you're happy that that like stinky guy texted you back. When Kafka wrote to Melina, <laughs> you are like poetry, I could get lost forever in your cloudy <laughs> obscurities. And, um, yeah, so I, like it's, it sort of just shows the irrelevance already of these two, you know, guys who read Kafka when they were teenagers and are now holding on to their, in their middle age, to their Kafka. Um, there's already a new generation inventing a new Kafka for their purposes. So great, yeah, great. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank really, you thank so you. much, Andre. Everybody. Thank you.